Thank you all. This is really exciting. We have over 100 people joining us from all over North America, it looks like. Um, I'm going to start with some introductions. I'm Eva Dunn-Frobig. I am the Events and Outreach Coordinator for Adventure Cycling Association. And welcome to Dirt Touring. Um, we're putting on this event, Dirt Touring, with tour leaders and ambassadors, Joe Riemann Snyder and Allison Seeger. And we are so excited to have you joining us. If you are not familiar with Adventure Cycling Association, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And our mission is to inspire, empower, and connect people to travel by bicycle. So um, we're based in Missoula, Montana, which is where I'm joining you from. And Joe, who will be speaking a little bit later, is joining you from Missoula as well. He is one of our tour leaders, which means he leads our guided tours and our, our educational courses. And he's joining us from his bike shop, Spotted Dog Bicycles. And then Allison, who is also a tour leader, is joining us from Baltimore, Maryland. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Allison and Joe. And um, I'm gonna go over some really quick housekeeping things. I mentioned um, staying muted. If you could make sure that you're muted throughout this entire uh, event, that would be fantastic. We are going to um, take questions, but we're gonna do it through the chat bar. And um, we are recording this. So we will make this available to you later. So you can watch it later. If you wanna share it with a friend who maybe missed it, you are welcome to do that. If you're not super familiar with Zoom, I wanna um, just make sure you know a few things. Uh, one is we're gonna be taking the questions through the chat um, menu bar, which is at the bottom of your screen. And then also, if you wanna just see the person who's speaking, you can click speaker view in the upper right hand corner. And if you'd like to see uh, everybody, you can click gallery view and there's actually an arrow to the right where you can scroll through and see everybody. And since we have over 100 people joining us right now, you'll have to do that in order to see everybody. Um, so to mute yourself, it's in the left, lower left hand corner and then you can also um, stop your video too if you wanna do that in the lower left hand corner. Um, I'm gonna just give you a, some quick context behind why we're doing this event. Um, Allison and Joe, like I said, are tour leaders with Adventure Cycling Association, and they were scheduled to teach our Intro to Dirt Touring course a couple weeks ago, actually in Montana. But of course, we had to cancel that due to the pandemic and um, most of our other guided tours this year. So they graciously volunteered to um, donate their time and provide some information today, which is just amazing because now we can provide this information to you for free. And of course, this is gonna be a condensed version of the Intro to Road uh, Dirt Touring course. It's not gonna be as comprehensive and it's gonna be quite different because normally that's a five day course where people ride together and camp and cook together, but they're just gonna be covering some information in about an hour. We're probably gonna go an hour and a half max, um, including questions. Um, and that's another thing, if you need to leave this event at any time, feel free. Like I said, we're recording it so you can come back later and, um, and you can watch it later. So um, I also mentioned that Joe and Allison are ambassadors for Adventure Cycling Association. And I just wanna let you know what that means. So we have an ambassador program where we provide resources for people like Joe and Allison, and probably like a lot of you who are joining us today who have a lot of knowledge and, and passion for bicycle travel, and you would love to share it with others and inspire others to travel by bike. So if that is something that resonates with you, we would love to connect with you and get you looped into our ambassador program where we provide tools and resources and support you to put on events like this. Normally they're done in person, but we've been doing a lot of these online events for the past six months. And um, the great thing about them is that people can join from all over the country, all over the world. So it's been really exciting. So if you are interested in the ambassador program, send me an email at eva at adventurecycling.org, or you can also go to our website, adventurecycling.org forward slash ambassador. And I will be sharing those links in the chat feature with you. And by the way, speaking of that, I forgot to mention, I encourage you not to click on any links that people post except for the ones that I'm posting or Allison or, and Joe are posting. 
And we will follow up with an email later with some of those links. But, um, you know, just for security reasons, it's just safer to only click on links that from somebody that you know and trust. So um, please keep that in mind as well. So like I said, we're going to take questions throughout this event in the chat feature, and I'll be posing those to Allison and Joe uh, during breaks during this event. And so we're going to start off with a question for you. And that is, what is your favorite local bike overnight? So we want to know, you know, just describe it really quick, or if you, you know, have a name for it, type it in the chat, and also include where it's located, because we want to know where these great local bike overnights are. Uh, right now, Adventure Cycling Association is not recommending that people travel on our long distance routes, like from state to state, but it is possible to go on a bike overnight if you stay close to home. And Allison's actually going to talk a little bit more about that later. But we do have an event, um, Bike Travel Weekend and Bike Your Park Day, where we encourage people to go on bike overnights. And that is happening the last weekend in September. So if you do have a favorite local bike overnight, overnight first we want to hear about it. We want you to post it in the chat. And then we also would love for you to register that ride and participate in it during the weekend of September 25th through the 27th. So that's, um, if you go to biketravelweekend.org, you can register there. And everybody who registers is entered to win a salsa cutthroat bike. So check that out. And with that, I know that was a lot of information to cover. I am gonna turn it over to Allison, who's gonna um, get to the fun part and get to the great uh, content about dirt touring and bike packing that she has ready to share with you. So Allison, it's, it's, all, um, it's all you. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. Hey everyone, I'm so happy that um, to see a few familiar faces and to get to talk about one of my favorite things. Um, so the the course that Joe and I were going to um, to lead was called Intro to Dirt Touring. Um, and so we were um, going to be traveling by bicycle on some dirt and some gravel um, up around Whitefish, Montana. You may have also heard the term bikepacking and you might be sort of thinking, what's dirt touring? What's bikepacking? Um, a lot of folks sort of use these terms interchangeably. Um, if you do a Google search of bikepacking, you'll come across some images like this. So some really um, phenomenal um, cyclists, Lael and Alexandra. Um, I will say they are biking sometimes, is it true, hundreds of miles a day. So that these are their setups for the Great Divide mountain bike ride. Um, when I rode the Great um, Divide, I was not biking hundreds of miles every day. So on dirt and gravel, I was doing more like 50 or 60. Because of that, I want to carry a little bit more. I need to carry a little bit more. There's going to be more days where I'm between towns and services. So I might have to carry several days worth of groceries. Um, I also am not spending like 12 hours on my bike. So I like to bring fun things like watercolors and stamps and my Kindle. Um, so there's lots of ways of doing this and there's really not one right way. Um, I had some riders who rode from Banff to Whitefish with me last year and some riders had sort of like, you'll see on the left, a more typical bike packing setup. Um, and you'll see on the right, um, some trailers. Um, I have seen people on all types of setups, um, including unicycles, make it. Um, and it's sort of the experience you want to have. So all of these riders were able to carry three days worth of groceries and um, have a lot of fun. So um, lots of different setups. Sometimes you have to be a little creative. So you'll notice in this um, photo, we're carrying gear not only for ourselves, but for a group. So the guy all the way on the right who's riding into mountains, he had to bungee um, a 10 quart pot to the back of his bike packing bag. So um, you get some really creative stuff. And you know, 15 years ago when people were wanting that more bike packing set up, they had to make a lot of their own bags. Now you can buy it. Um, if you're interested in what to pack, there's some great articles on adventure cycling and um, some of our friends and colleagues, Sid and Joyce, who may be on here, um, did a great session about bike packing. I'm just sort of thinking when I'm packing my bike about all the rooms in my house and what I would need. So um, what I'm going to be wearing on the bike, 
um, sort of like a little tool shed. And I know Joe will talk more about that. Um, my camp kitchen, um, what I want to eat, which I'll talk more about. My closet of on and off bike clothes. Um, my bathroom gear, fun stuff like my Kindle, my paints, um, a tent and um, a sleeping pad and sleeping bag. Um, right now though, there's some, some different stuffs that you um, might need to pack. Um, you pretty much always want to bring some hand sanitizer with you and have that really close, if not in your camelback, then maybe right on your front um, bag for when you use the restroom. But now you might wanna have several of these depending on how long you're going out. Um, you also will want to have masks. Um, I like to, if I'm um, on a dirt road by myself and no one's in sight, I really like the neck gaiters because you can wear them and then pull them up when you see someone coming. Um, if you are planning to stop and refuel, you can bring gloves. Um, if you're planning on really being self-sufficient, you might, instead of planning on stopping um, at gas stations, you might bring a water filter. So you're really in that back country and we'll talk about all those things. But um, overall, I'm really excited to share um, tonight because um, given the pandemic that's happening, um, and outside, you want to make sure you're on mute, um, are pretty low risk um, if you do it in ways that make it low risk. So um, if you are biking outside and camping outside, both of those things are low risk. And then you just want to make sure that you're doing that with people who are already in your circle. So you're biking and camping with people you live with. Um, you want to stick close to home. Um, so you want to ride and camp um, within one gas tank from home if you aren't biking directly from your house. Um, if you're feeling sick or if you've been in contact with someone, obviously you might have to cancel your trip. If the COVID guidelines from whatever communities, states, localities you're biking through, um, you wanna keep an eye on those. And if the guidelines change, you want to make sure you respect that and be willing to sort of adjust and change your trip. Um, but all that being said, there are some ways to kind of make it safer. So um, being really self-sufficient um, when you're bikepacking, that means um, if you are traveling and you normally like to stop like me at breweries and ice cream shops, your sort of sense of traveling is a little bit different. I'm not planning on stopping at every C store and challenging myself to cook out of this gas station. I'm kind of deciding I'm going to carry the groceries I need for the whole time. If you do have to go get groceries, making sure that you have um, face protection. If you're with a group, maybe just send one person. All those ways to kind of limit the spread. Um, for water, for bathrooms, um, there are kind of ways to limit the spread too. I mentioned you could bring um, a water filter. If you are bike packing, um, traveling on gravel, you're going to um, maybe be more in the back country anyway, where you would be thinking of that. If you were thinking about um, stopping somewhere to get water, a lot of um, gas stations have um, outdoor faucets. So there are ways, you know, even little ways where you can think about how do I want to get this where I have the least exposure um, possible. Um, same thing with bathrooms, you can kind of choose um, if you're really in the back country to do the trowel cat hole route, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, or making sure again that you're, if you're in a established campground that you have all the personal protective gear and hand sanitizer that you need. Um, and of course, we've talked a little bit about what that social distancing looks like while you're on a bike um, trip, but you want to make sure if you are going on a bike overnight, you're gonna want a social distance before and um, after when you come home. So with that, I will pass it to Joe, who is going to talk about um, some navigation stuff. Sweet, thanks, Allison. Yeah, so I'm going to do kind of navigation and route prep since they will go hand in hand quite a bit. But I'll start with route prep, uh, preparation and just like planning your trip and where you're going to go and what you're going to do. Uh, when I'm kind of beginning my thoughts on where to ride on dirt or even just tour, you know, you kind of start in a similar place. Where do you want to go? What do you want to see? What are, you know, what are you after really? For me, living in Missoula here, we have just so many different options to do these types of gravel riding or sing, even single track riding. Um, so I just kind of pinpoint a place I want to go, whether it's a national park or a state park, a rail trail. You know, we're surrounded here by national forests and national monuments, things like that. So I kind of choose 
something I want to see or a route I might want to follow that I can link up with other things and, you know, a forest I want to spend some time in. From there, it can kind of be trouble or it can be a little difficult, you know, figuring a route in that area. You know, if I go to Glacier, I can't necessarily ride on those trails. And so I might want to ride around Glacier or through the road or things like that. And so what I'll do then, I'm going to share my screen with you guys now, is I will start using some online resources. So the first one I definitely use, which I'm sure a lot of you have used before, is Ride with GPS. Ride with GPS, I mean, you're able to build your routes, you're able to send them to your phone, to your Garmin, all these sorts of things, share them with your friends. It's great for road, it's great for backcountry. It's just, you can see all these different layers of maps when you're trying to find gravel roads or trying to find gates or things you can't go through. So if I'm just gonna try and do an overnight around Missoula that I haven't done before, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go to this find over here um, and then we'll just type in Missoula, Montana within 50 miles and I'll search that. And that is gonna pull up a lot of different routes that folks in my area have also shared. So like this Tale of Two Creeks, a handful of these are, are routed by adventure cycling folks themselves. Um, but it's just a really great way to see what everybody else is doing in your area and kind of get a feel for it. Plus it's got maps to just, you know, send to your phone just like, you know, you would route your own map. Um, so if you're routing on Ride with GPS and you want to share with other folks, just keep make sure when you finish routing that it's made public because it's a really cool resource we can all kind of share. And, you know, and I'm able to send messages to folks that have also put these routes up so we can chat with each other. I can see what's the best time of year to go. I can see if that weird swamp looking thing was actually passable or not. Um, and so it's this is like my go-to for building maps and for just getting a first general idea. The next step for me is always bikepacking.com. If you haven't checked these guys out yet, they've been here for quite a while. They've done a lot of pioneering of this, you know, bikepacking movement. And you can see there's Bikepacking 101. That's gonna be, you know, they're gonna help out kind of with what we're talking about right now. Um, but the really cool thing is the route section. And this route section has, you know, you can kind of go in here, you can see anything from a single track tour, gravel tour, you know, all road tour, this sort of stuff, fat bike tour, if you're into the snow. Um, but the other thing is you can do here is, you know, your weekend or things like this. So a cool thing to do, I mean, we'll look at the United States here and I'll look in the Pacific Northwest since that's where I am mostly. Um, but we're gonna go down to the Northwest. And then from here, there's all these different routes that mostly they're contributed by the, the people that work at bikepacking.com. But there's also a lot of guest routes coming on as well. And you have just overnight routes all the way up to like 50, 60 day sort of routes. So this one up in Whitefish, I'll click on here. It's a pretty cool one near, right in between Whitefish and Glacier. Um, and the cool thing is it kind of gives you a sense of what the ride's going to be like. You know, there's only 2% single track, but it's 87% unpaved. So we're looking at a lot of forest road up in the flathead there. Um, you're going to see your ascent is. So if, you know, 7,800 climbing is too much for you, that's, then you just move on to the next route. Take anywhere from two to three days. And then the really nice part about this is they, you know, give you some nice photos and outlines and everything. Um, but they'll put a ride a GPS map right here. And so you can download this as a GPX file right to your phone or right to your Garmin. They've got, you know, way marks on all these maps that show you where to camp, where to eat, you know, even like viewpoints and things like that. And then this, which we're all very used to from road touring is, you know, your elevation gain. And so that is a, a nice thing to see because elevation on dirt is different than elevation on the road. And so it's something to think about when you're planning these routes. The next one I often use, and I'm definitely partial to, is Bikepacking Roots. These guys are a nonprofit as well, and they do a lot of land advocacy and also um, advocacy for getting minorities and other people out in the, in the forest as well. Um, and so they, they don't have as many routes as, as bikepacking.com, but they do have quite a bit that they've been pioneering over the past few years. So they have this Wild West route, which parallels the Great Divide Tour. Um, just kind of going through the more desert instead, but you can see they're working on a lot of different stuff all over the Western states here. There's another great, the nice thing about bikepacking routes is there's a group of us, I'm one of the regional advisors for the Rocky Mountains, and so the Northern Rocky Mountains, and so if you go into community or about, you can see 
who we are and you can kind of look through, um, you can see the board members and the director and everything, but then there's a group of advisors at the bottom and all these people are regional. And so you can, you know, you're going to go to Washington and you want to ride. Well, you can reach out to some of these folks and we can help you kind of like tell you the best routes that we like to ride in the area. So it's just getting firsthand from people that are actually out creating routes or, you know, just out there doing it on the weekends. So a nice thing to do there. So I'm gonna stop my share here. So the next thing you gotta really think about is where to camp. Um, it's a little bit different, you know, you can still rely on those campgrounds that you would if you're road touring. RV parks are awesome. Uh, you know, places with showers are really nice still. And those can all be linked up with dirt. Just cause you're in the back country for the day doesn't mean you're not gonna come down to the front country and stay somewhere along the freeway or whatever. So those, you know, you gotta really, I build a ton of routes on Ride With GPS, spent hours doing it, and then realized there's nowhere to camp within 100 miles of itself. So it's you got to think about those things while you're while you're making these routes. Um, in the West, we're lucky to have so much forest service land because we're able to kind of camp anywhere responsibly. Um, but that being said, you know I don't always want to camp with no bathroom or no shower, so or you know no brewery, things like that. So there's you can link all these things up together. So you spend a night out in the back country one day and you camp wherever the heck you want. Then the next day you come to a, you know, a forest service campground or to a RV park or whatever. So there's just so much you can link together and it shouldn't always be thought of like, it's gotta be dirt, it's gotta be back country. It can be, you know, front country, back country. It's, it can all be fluid together. Um, so then navigation is, I mean, very similar to the way you would navigate on a road tour, you know, down the coast or wherever. Um, you can do it map with, with paper maps. You can do it electronically, um, ride with GPS. Again, that's a really great mapping tool, a really great navigation tool. The argument between maps and electronic is becoming, you know, a little less prevalent. I think we're, a lot of folks are moving to Garmin's and moving to cell phones. Personally, I, when I'm even in like deep forest where I know I don't have cell service, I'm still using my cell phone to use ride with GPS. And that's because the cell phone is just more e easily navigable, navigable. Um, and uh, it's also coming with me no matter what. You know, I'm going to have my phone, so it's just one less thing I need to carry. I've used Garmin's, um, which I really enjoy. The battery life is a lot longer on a Garmin. That's a pretty good plus. And then I always still carry a paper map with me. So if I'm going into the Bitterroots are right next to us in Montana here and in northern Idaho, and they are expansive and they are you can get lost in them so i'll carry like a northern bitter root map with me um i likely won't use it i mean i prefer not to end up having to use it because i mean something's gone wrong probably but it is a good backup plan to have you know atlases road atlases are nice to have because then you can at least orientate yourself to what you're around um i would say good places to pick these up rei is has an incredible map selection um the usgs uh, website. You can go to their website and you can pinpoint anywhere in the country that you want to have a map for and they'll send you that map. Adventure Cycling has a lot. A lot of their maps incorporate these dirt routes too um, and then other dirt routes spawn off those routes. And then your local ranger station. If you are close to a BLM office or a U.S. Forest Service office, those places always have maps on hand that you can buy. Um, and then another option is like your local bike shops will often carry um, maps to their local areas anyway, you know, we'll carry maps that are going to be the greater Missoula area, which will at least get you into our local forests and things like that. So that was, I mean, yeah, the paper maps are just a really nice backup to have for if something goes wrong with that electronic navigation. So, so I think that sums up that I'm going to pass it back to Eva. Great, thanks so much, Joe, um, and also Allison. That was great information. And I know we had a few people join us um, after Allison and Joe got started. So just to let the folks know who joined us a little bit late, we are talking about dirt touring. And we have two of our really knowledgeable and passionate tour leaders, Allison Seeger and Joe Raymond Snyder joining us today. They teach the Intro to Dirt Touring course for Adventure Cycling Association. And they're volunteering their time today to provide a more um, concise overview of dirt touring and to answer any questions you might have. Um, we haven't had a lot of questions yet, but if you do have a question, you can type it in the chat 
bar at any time during this event. We're gonna take a break right now and take some questions. So um, if you'd like to uh, type them in now, please go ahead. We're gonna have another um, time during the event when we're gonna take questions as well. So you can always type in your question later. We did have one comment from somebody that I saw that was about safe biking during the pandemic. And Allison did touch on that a little bit, but um, the comment was that campgrounds in his area or her area were packed. And so I don't know, Allison and Joe, if you have anything you wanna add to that. Um, Allison, do you have anything you wanna add? Yeah, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of camping right now because it's one of the few things people can go and do. Um, so I've encountered campgrounds and friends have encountered campgrounds this summer where they aren't allowing tent camping. They have closed down the public bathroom. So you have to have an RV. I've encountered campgrounds and state parks that are only booking every other site and other campgrounds that are just booking as usual, but there's more people who want to be there. So um, definitely um, it's exciting when there's a lot of people out there, but that might make distancing a little bit um, tricky. So kind of like if you have the opportunity to kind of pick and choose your campsite on a map on Reserve America or Reserve.gov, you can kind of try and see which one looks far away from other campsites. But um, for sure, that can be really challenging. Thanks for sharing. Joe? Yeah, I would say I, I was in northern Idaho riding a couple weeks ago and we passed six or seven campgrounds that were just booked full. And this was a Friday night. So, I mean, for me, if you have the opportunity, try a Tuesday or a Wednesday, you know, like, I mean, I don't, it just depends where you are. Of course, if you're up in Glacier, it's going to be packed the whole time. There's really no getting around that. So if that's, you know, something, you know, to avoid, then I guess you're going to need to try and find somewhere else to go. That's the, the kicker of it is, and a lot of these like places like Glacier, Yellowstone or, big parks, state parks in, you know, more compact areas oftentimes have a forest around them that might be, have some backcountry camping instead. So it might just be park the bike and then hike in. There's, there's different options for that sort of thing too. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Well, we all of a sudden got a whole bunch of questions. So, um, Joe, do you want to take this one? Uh, Joyce Casey is wondering when planning a trip, how many miles a day should I plan for? You know, that's tough. I, again, a lot of it has to do with the terrain you're riding. Elevation is killer. Um, if you're going to climb 10,000 feet in a day, you probably only want to ride 30 miles, if you're not even less. Um, I generally personally try and plan for 50. Um, on a, if I'm like out on a week or something, I'll plan for 50. Some days I might go 30. Uh, one day I might go like 80. And those 80 mile days are just kind of not fun um you just really end up kind of regretting the decision you made in the morning um so i don't know yeah i kind of plan for the same amount of miles each day if i can and again it's around where i can camp and where i can refuel and things like that um but i shoot for 40 to 50 and again that's it's all about your personal you know your physical shape you're in and where you live i mean because out here we're climbing a ton to go anywhere so Great. Um, Allison, I, you want to take the next one? Alexi Besser is wondering what advice you have for a solo rider. Mm. Um, I would say, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, I think in terms of safety, so I've, I've camped solo um, and toured solo a lot. In terms of safety, I always let people know where I'm going um, and when they should expect me back. Um, in terms of just, um, you know, usually if you're alone, it means you're never alone. I've found that when I travel solo, I'm really approachable. So I end up making friends almost wherever I go versus when I'm traveling in a group that can tend to be kind of insular and I'm not interacting with locals a lot. Um, during the pandemic, that's sort of changed, right? So when I'm traveling alone, I might be trying to stay alone. So I was really, um, when I did a bike overnight, during the pandemic, I was really trying to think about what books am I going to read and, and um, who am I going to write letters to because I thought I am going to be in my own head a lot if I'm just out here and I'm trying not to see other people. Great, thank you. Um, Joe, uh, would you answer this one from Kevin Anzel? It's, is a full suspension bike okay for bike packing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, 
kind of comes down to whatever bike you like to ride is okay for bikepacking, but also full suspension. I mean, it can be overkill for some things. If for a gravel road, it might be overkill, but for some people that's, it's more comfortable to ride and that's what they're efficient on. Um, bikepacking routes, that one I was showing you guys earlier, the um, exec, the CEO of bikepacking routes or the director, Kurt is a long, he's a, fat he does long days uh he's a racer who's got a lot of records and everything like that and he only bike packs on full suspension even on gravel roads so it's just it really i mean i'd say yes if you have a full suspension bike that can pack your gear the way you want to do it so yeah cool um allison the next question is about minimum t width of tires for dirt touring um, Joel W is wondering, is that highly dependent on the area? He, um, he's just wondering what advice you have. Yeah, great question, Joel. Um, and go feel free to weigh in on this one um, as well. My very best advice is to try riding some similar terrain um, and some similar surfaces as to what you'll be riding and to certainly try riding your bike when it's loaded because your bike feels different um, when you don't have all your camping gear and food on it than when you do. Um, so if I'm riding a really technical um, route, I'm gonna need more than just like my normal <laughs> but yeah definitely you want to be writing it joe you want to weigh in there yeah i mean it's gonna like, it's gonna depend again on the train i on my bikes i don't have anything less than a 45 even on like i, I led a, the coastal tour last fall and i still rode on 45s because it's it's more comfortable um you know if you're going to be somewhere super chunky like down in the desert you're going to probably want to be on a 2.5 if not more um two inch 2.5 inches um if you're going to be anywhere that it's sandy, you might need a big three inch tire or a fat tire. It's, it's really just knowing the places you're going to. And again, like those resources online are really good. Folks that have ridden there before can tell you what they think of that. But I don't think there's a minimum or a maximum. I've, I've been on a two inch tire with somebody that was on a five inch, you know, big surly tire. And so it's just, it's what you're comfortable on and what you think you can, you know, efficiently move on and not just kill yourself with. So. Cool, thanks. Um, Joe, I have another one for you. It's from Robert Efron, and he is wondering if you can uh, compare Strava with oh, Ride with GPS for mapping. What are the differences? Uh, I don't use Strava very much. I'm not uh, the kind of rider that's really marking my miles and my time all that much. And so I just don't, I, I think they're very similar in the sense that they will both track you very nicely. They'll track your miles, they'll track your time, they'll track your average, and they'll track that route that you can then dump into a, a route and like fiddle with later. But I'm, I'm just on for like Kamut and Strava. I just don't know that well. I'm a millennial that doesn't do well with technology. So. Um, okay, great. Uh, we're going to try to answer all of the questions if we can tonight. But if we can't, if we can't get to all of them, we are going to be posting this rec the recording of this event on our blog in the next few weeks. And we're gonna try to get to all of the questions at that time. So if we don't get to your question, just know that we will uh, make every effort to answer it um, either tonight or um, in the blog in a written format. So uh, the next question I have is for Allison. And somebody wants to know how you differentiate between traditional panniers and racks and setups and the and bike packing um, equipment where you would you know carry your belongings on your bike. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I um, shared a little bit that I like when I've done the Great Divide um, Bamp to. Um, Antelope Wells, I have carried um, back panniers um, and then some, you know, your, your setup sort of changes and even during a course of a ride, you might send stuff home and mail stuff out. Um, but I've, I've always toured with bike um, back panniers because it's what I have and I do road touring as well. I think the one time where I've done like sort of like the, the seat bag, the relevant designs or whatever you want to do in the frame bag or when I um, I'm not camping. So if I booked like a cool fire tower or something like that, and I know all I need to bring with me um, is a sleeping bag, you know, then I might um, travel a little lighter, but people do um, 
use those. I think, you know, you want to be able to be self-sufficient um, in COVID and not. So you want to make sure that you have everything um, that you need. Um, and, a, and a lot of people, you know, you can, you can pay more, you can um, find different ways to pack things on your bike, and then you can have a little bit more fun, especially on those technical trails too. So I think that is like the, the trade-off for wanting to um, have more of like a bike pack the weight distribution, et cetera, it can be a lot more fun if you're, um, if you're into like some of those more technical trails, if you're doing um, long distance and covering a lot of different surfaces and going several days with groceries, I have found that myself, I need a little bit more carrying capacity. Joe, you want to weigh in? Sure. I am, uh, I'm like kind of the opposite. So I use mostly those soft bags. Um, all the frame bags, I use paneers like I use paneers when I'm road touring and things like that but otherwise I don't keep any racks on my bike other than bottle cages um, or like those kind of big salsa racks uh, just because I can put my tent in there or my sleeping pad or whatever but I often don't carry a tent either I will carry just like a tarp or whatever and so that allows me then to keep those soft bags and then if I'm only doing like a three-day trip I'm probably not going to carry a stove or anything either it's going to just be like as much calories and as small of a container as possible um and but that being said it is yeah it can be a little it's it's less fun sometimes so when i when i'm doing those kind of tours and even i'll i'll road tour with those types of bags instead because i do know i might stop in a hotel or i'm going to eat out a little bit more and so even though i'm not in the backcountry trying to save weight i'm able to bring different sorts of things in those bags and if you get a really good kit a kit that you like really like know well and you've dialed in you can really pack a lot of stuff in there it's just a very different way of packing um so yeah i i, I love paneers for because of the the great amount of things you can bring and the more comfort you can bring but when i'm in the woods i just kind of have a different mentality i'm hoping to find single track i'm hoping to do those things which does balance better when you are riding faster down descents and things like that so Cool. Well, we're going to take one more question and then get back to the event uh, content. Uh, maybe, Allison, do you want to take this one? Um, so somebody is wondering, are there any non-obvious comfort items that you've discovered over time make your trip a lot more fun? Ooh, I would like to hear that question from everyone. I feel like everyone <laughs> kind of has their own um their own thing i think for me it's it's food i definitely have toured where i'm just eating um you know tortillas with peanut butter for dinner and then tortillas with cheese for lunch um but i i like cooking i like bringing sort of like a spice kit sometimes i will load all my spice into like one and have one spice mix that i'll use for a trip um or some like hot sauce and things like that that to me when you get to have a good meal at the end of a ride is really fun, even if you're Mine's kind of along the same lines. That's, it's tough. Uh, candy is a big one, you know, snicker bars and gummies and things like that. Um, I will pack way more candy than I will actually end up eating and thinking I'm going to eat it all. And I don't, um, but it's, yeah, as far as like comfort things go, otherwise I bring a swimsuit no matter what time of year because you never know when you're going to find a place to swim. So that's, that's one of them. But awesome. um, yeah, other than that, I'm not sure. Yeah. Great. Um, well, uh, before uh, Allison and Joe continue, I'm going to do make a little pitch for Adventure Cycling membership. Um, if you are not a member of Adventure Cycling Association, we are doing a um, promotion tonight where we're giving away complimentary six month memberships to people in the United who reside in the United States and are not already members of Adventure Cycling. So I'm going to post a link to that here uh, in the next minute or two. And you can also, if you are a member of Adventure Cycling Association already, you can share this link with a friend who's not already a member and they can try it out, get our magazine Adventure Cyclist in the mail and start being part of this amazing community of bicycle travelers. And we have, we've had between like 130 and 140 people joining us consistently tonight. So that in itself is, is really cool and, and shows how many people are out there who are really interested in traveling by bike. So thank you again, everybody for joining us and especially to Allison and Joe. And um, 
now I'm going to turn this back over to Allison. She's going to talk more about camping and cooking, and then Joe is going to talk about mechanics. So Allison, it's all you. All right. So um, I'll talk about camping in the backcountry. So Joe and I were going to be um, leading this intro course, and we were going to go on a four-day tour um, near Glacier National Park. And um, last year, everyone's first question, and many questions were about bears and what to do about bears while in the backcountry. Um, so the best thing you can do in bear country is not travel alone. Um, Sometimes that happens. I've traveled in bear country alone. Um, I don't have on my desk um, bear spray because you can't fly with it. So I usually donate mine when I leave bear country and come back to the East Coast, but um, carry bear spray. I carry mine right on my camelback. So even if I have to go find a restroom in the woods, I have it with me. Um, I've also practiced my quick draw. So I feel ready, watched a few YouTube videos. Um, for food, um, you wanna make sure um, you can hang your food um, so not every campsite, especially if you're in the back country, um, established campsites usually have bear boxes, but in the back country they don't. So I usually designate one, one pannier to be sort of the bear hang. So I'll keep all my food and then I'll have like a rope and then that'll be the one I just tie up in the tree. Um, again, a good thing to practice before you set out. Um, although if you're in camp, there's nothing better to do than throw a bunch of rocks until you eventually get one over a good limb. Um, and this works not just for bears, but like more likely you're going to have other critters trying to chew through your expensive panniers. So you definitely want to do that and camp far away from your food, camp far away from where you cook. Um, and just as you're traveling through the back country, you want to be making noise. Um, bears aren't out to get you. Um, you just don't want to surprise them or come between them and their food and their cubs. But um, really the bigger safety concerns when you're in the back country aren't bears, um, although that's what I'm personally most afraid of. Um, it's more, um, can you be self-sufficient? Can you get yourself out of trouble? So in the back country, you want to make sure Sure that you know what where you are so kind of like Joe talked about a navigation and then also make sure that someone else knows where you are and where you're going to be so a couple people in the chat shared that they share their map with someone at home their Strava some people carry devices so they can do that but you want to make sure you know where you are and can get out um, you also just want to make sure that you have the right gear so if you're traveling in the mountains where the weather changes you don't just want to search for the weather um, you know at the town where you're starting from, but you probably want to search the weather at the city. Lots of changes in weather because um, you don't want to be um, out in the elements. And then you probably want to bring a first aid kit too. So, um, and then not only responsibility and safety for yourself, but also like our responsibility to the world. So um, when I travel, when we travel, we follow leave no trace principles. Um, that means if we're camping, we're camping on durable surfaces. We aren't disrupting vegetation as much as possible. Um, when we camp, when we go to the restroom, we're sh shooting to be like a football field length from water. Um, when we bring stuff in, whether that's food and then we have wrappers or food and we didn't finish it all, um, we're packing it out with us. Um, for the bathroom, we can do those little wag bags or we can do coffee containers with wag bags and carry our own human waste out of the backcountry with us, which you might have to do if you're on like tundra type surfaces. Um, but a lot of times you can bring a trowel and you can dig a cat hole again, a hundred yards from water. Um, and then the thing I think is um, really confusing for Leave No Trace is, is dishes, especially if you are not going to be one of those people in bars for every meal, you're going to want to do dishes in the back country and um, not leave a trace and not leave um, good smelling stuff for bears to find at your campsite and then for the next person who camps there to have like a very friendly bear. So you want to make sure you bring like plastic bags so you can pack out. Um, so I carry like my cooking gear and beside just my coffee stuff and my little stove. Um, I carry, this is like a little tea thing. There's lots of ways to do this, but a lot of times if I'm scraping out my pot and I want to scrape out all my food, I'll also kind of with my biodegradable soap, I'll give it a rinse and I'll try and before I spray my water broadcasting it, or you can also dig a hole the same way you do for the restroom. Um, I'm just going to filter out some of my particles, try and keep those with me and pack those out with the rest of my trash instead of leaving those because we really want to 
leave places as we find it. Um, which sort of brings me to my favorite talk topic, talking about cooking in the backcountry. Um, and this really spans the entire um, spectrum. So some people like to eat bars, they bring their peanut butter and they eat straight out of the jar and they kind of just go. I'm somebody who really likes to cook. So in the middle of that, you might have um, some of those meals where all you need to do is heat up water. Um, my sister sent me this one. It says three sisters stew. That's very cute. Um, a lot of times you want to make food though. So if you're making food, um, some of the things that do really well, um, like lentils are pretty light, but pretty filling and they don't take that long to cook. You're kind of thinking about what's nutritious, um, what's calorically dense. Um, you're thinking about what's lightweight, but if you are a backpacker, so there's a lot of people who are backpackers before they're bike packers. Um, the nice thing about bike packing is you can carry a little more weight and be a little more um, luxurious. So you're, you're thinking about weight, but you're also just thinking about like what's nutritious, what's calorically dense, and you basically wanna double whatever serving size or calories you need because you're using a lot. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have enough to eat and it's always better to have too much when it comes to food than not enough and sort of like have that bonk. Um, so things that carry well and things that don't carry well, um, just when I'm packing things like hot sauce, like glass jars do not carry well. Um, plastic ones, which are really hard to find, do. So if I find a nice little plastic one, I might refill it from my big hot sauce um, at home and have that be like my camping thing. Um, a banana, you know, won't carry very well. An apple or orange might last a day but things like carrots or onions or sweet potatoes even three days in could be pretty good four days in could be pretty good um, and then you have things like um, freeze-dried and dehydrated foods um, and I just sort of think about you know dinner I might do something kind of fancy but for breakfast I like these little silicone bags and I will just like pack a bunch of steel cut oats put some peanut butter powder pack some like dried fruit in there and then that's like my breakfast. Um, I heard a couple people in the chat talking about coffee. So a lot of options there on the call. I see Anne and Hugh and Bernie. So folks who traveled cross country, if you're in a group, somebody can carry um, a French press. If you're by yourself, you might choose to have, let's see if I can find where I put it. You might choose to have like a little um, pour over dealy. You can buy a lot of these things at REI with like a little mesh thing. So you can bring your own ground coffee. I've used instant too. If it's just me, I think coffee tastes really amazing in the morning at camp, even if it's instant. So um, that's kind of, that's kind of what I do. Um, but yeah, um, I'll pass it to Joe and he'll talk a little bit about mechanics. Sweet. Thanks, Allison. Um, so mechanics, yeah, I think is like a pretty important thing about bike touring that a lot of people overlook because we're just kind of used to there being a bike shop every so often. And we are fortunate there, there is a bike shop every so often, but when you are in the back country, you may still come across shops here and there, but it's still good to be a little more prepared. So this is what I carry. Uh, it's about the size of like, you know, a sandwich burrito or something like that. Uh, I carry this, I carry a hand pump, and depending upon my bike, I carry a tube. But it's, um, I just, let me pull up what's exactly going on in here, because that'll help out. So this is what's inside of there. Um, this is, it's, it looks small, it looks like not very much, but this is basically a bike shop in a very tiny kit. I can kind of do whatever I need to do on my bike with all of these tools. Um, so starting with this multi-tool, up in the left corner here. This is a Crank Brothers multi-tool. It's about $25. It has a chain breaker. It has a couple different spoke wrenches. This thing right here is an open face wrench. And then it has all your Allen wrenches, all your torque bits, and then a, a flathead and a Phillips screwdriver. All those things are, I mean, that tool itself can mostly tune up your bike how you might need it tuned. Um, the Torx bit in there, which is one a lot of folks may not have on their tools, is becoming pretty popular uh, on mountain bike brakes, on rotor bolts, on gravel bikes, on all these sorts of bikes that are a little newer. That's a, the T25 is a pretty common thing on those and really good to have. So if you're on an old multi-tool, that might be something to check out before you go out next time, just because it it's, it's pretty important. 
going down to this chain tool and master link tool. Um, this is a wolf tooth tool. This is, allows me to pull my master link off, which most new chains have now as well. If you bend your ch a chain link or something like this, this can, I can pull that master link off. This also doubles as a tire lever right there. And then these are the links of the two different speeds of my bike. So this colorful one is a 12 speed for my mountain bikes. And then this is an 11 speed for my gravel bike and my road stuff. So this is just a really nice small way to keep a couple different tools together. And it's convenient to have. You don't necessarily need a master link tool. You can kind of break it apart with your hands, but if it's just, a, it's convenient and it's small. The CO2 blaster and the canister I carry because most of my bikes are tubeless. And I think a lot of folks' bikes are tubeless now too, especially mountain bikes and bikes you might think of as like a, ba a bike packing bike. Um, even my like 700 C bikes have tubeless tires on them as well. This is going to help me if I not get a hole in that tire, but if I burp that tire off of the rim, which just means that the pressure was maybe too low and the, the, the bead came right off of there. This is going to help me reseat that on there. And it's just a, it's a nice way to inflate your tire without necessarily having to use the hand pump. The hand pump generally is not strong enough to get your tire back seated so you can move on basically. Zip ties are just crucial for everything. I mean, they hold your cables on there. They can be used in place of a rack bolt if you lose that. I mean, they can be used for just about anything. They can be used on your tent poles, not just your bike. So there, you got to think about tools in your mechanics kit beyond just your bicycle because there's a lot of things that you know you might need that can't be helped while you're in the backcountry. I carry this tire lever here because it's it, this is a Pedro's lever. It's a very thick plastic. And it's just nicer on your rims than this metal one is. And I've just been using it for years. So it comes with me everywhere, basically. The vulcanized patch kit, I choose over those, like the little square one that has the pre-glued patches because they're thicker. Uh, um, they, they just, they can cover more space. And because once you get a vulcanized patch on there, once you glue that thing on, it's, it's a permanent fix. Whereas those little pre-glued ones are really great for getting you out of your like local single track or something like that but you're probably going to want to change your tube and then a vulcanized patch can also be used on the side of your tire if you get a rip on your tire that's a good way to patch that up as well the fiber fix spoke is a cool thing i actually didn't even know about until i did my training for uh adventure cycling the leader training and it's a it's a kevlar string that can actually fix your spoke if you were to break your spoke so you can loop it through your hub back up to the nipple on your rim. And that can act as it can equal out your tire because otherwise you break a spoke and your tire is going to want to wobble like this. And oftentimes that, that's going to hit your frame and you're really just not going to be able to go anywhere. So this is, I've never had to use it. I hope never to have to use it, but it's a great way to bring a spoke into the back country without bringing the cassette tool and the chain tool and all the other tools you would need to pull that cassette off in order to replace a spoke. The duct tape is, I mean, you can just use it for just about anything. If a strap breaks, it can be a strap. If a 10 pole breaks, it can tape that up. I mean, if you're everything, your cables are hanging out, that's a great way to do that as well. Um, bacon strips are basically a little piece of rubber with this tiny little fork. And if you have tubeless tires and you get a hole in that tire, you very tubeless uh, specific sort of thing you could probably use it on a normal tire but it doesn't do much for you um i carry a handful of different bolts these little black ones are rotor, rotor bolts because so many bikes nowadays road bikes included um touring bikes have disc brakes and so i've never i've worked in bike shops and now in this shop and i've never seen somebody's rotor bolt come out so they're very they're torqued and they're very highly so you shouldn't really ever have to worry about it but if it did come out it'd be a pretty a detrimental one to lose and so they're really tiny they're really lightweight i feel like might as well just carry a couple these m5 bolts that's just the pitch of the thread um m5 is basically going to be it's going to hold your bottle cages on. It's going to hold your racks on anything. Any of those bosses on your bike have an M5 pitch. And so they can be, you know, a four millimeter head. This one's a five millimeter head. It doesn't really matter because you're going to have it up in that multi-tool anyway. And then the last thing I carry are tire boots because not always a patch, not always the bacon strip is going to work to plug a hole. And so if you get a big slash on the sidewall, this is a really great way 
it's a sticky, basically a big sticky piece of plastic that goes in between your tube and your um, and your tire so that you're, when you reinflate a new tube or you patch your tube and you blow it up back up, it's, it's not going to shoot right up the side of your tire and break again. So this is what I carry. This is pretty minimal. Um, this, you know, this, this makes me feel comfortable when I'm out riding, whether it's on the road or whether I'm in the back country, you know, it's a way for me to not bring the bigger like shop tools that I don't really ever use anyway. But that said, I would suggest bringing whatever makes you feel comfortable. I mean, especially if you're in a place that you're not necessarily comfortable with and you don't know when the bike next bike shop is, you don't know when the next like pickup truck that can give you a ride is going to be. These are really, I mean, just bring whatever is right for you. For me, this is, this is it. And it's small. And that's probably because I've so much of my touring has been with those soft bags and I need to like save space and everything like that. But I would say the next thing about mechanics is going to be how to prepare. So I think a lot of folks go into things without thinking about how they're going to prepare. And that's just like, that can really, you know, put you in a bad spot. And so I'm going to switch over to some nice things that I like to use um, when you're getting in the backcountry. I mean, I would say backcountry, front country, you should definitely be a little bit savvy at mechanics, you know, know how to change the tire, understand your derailleur. And if you're just like not understanding any of that at all, I totally understand it takes a lot to learn, but there's so much online that you can look at. This first one is this gentleman's name is Sheldon Brown. And he is a like renowned bike mechanic who built this website. He's built many, he's created the standards on how to do certain things. He's created the standards on, you know, different gear ratios, different everything, touring, all this sort of stuff. This is a really like kind of cryptic old looking website, but it's, it's just so packed full of different like diagrams and everything like this. And this man like really just did a ton for the, the mechanic side of, of biking. Um, for those that want maybe a little bit more newer age looking things, Park Tool is, um, they're probably the most renowned tool company in, in bikes industry at all. They're the blue handle tools that you probably see at your local bike shop. They have this really awesome website that shows like repair help so you can come into their website you can type in what you need or you can just like click on certain things so right now i'm on derailleur systems because that seems to hold the most people up and then you can watch videos um and they'll like step by step videos so sometimes when i'm bleeding a, bleeding a break at the shop it's a break i've never seen i'm gonna go on park and see what they have to say about it because it's just it's for everybody from professionals to brand new people learning mechanics um the other thing I would say is, oh, when, so you're, you're in the back country and you're, you're got no cell phone service. How are you supposed to look up these videos? The one thing I like to do is if I'm unaware of how something works, if I'm on, like, I'm not feeling quite confident on it, look it up before you go on your cell phone, like find a diagram, find a step-by-step -step through reading. Don't find a video, pull that up on your browser and leave it pulled up because when you're in, you know, somewhere with no cell phone service, you're going to be able to pull up your browser and it's still going to be there and you're going to be able to read through and at least get an idea on how to do that. So you may not be able to get the, like the nice video that's telling you everything, but it's going to be better than nothing at all. So there's ways to prepare yourself while you're right before you go. But again, just, you know, take some time to make sure you have an idea of these and then build your little toolkit the best way that makes you feel comfortable. I mean, don't tell that's too big. That's too small. It's just whatever you feel good about. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to pass it back to Eva and we'll probably answer some more questions. Cool. Thanks, Joe. That was awesome. Um, and if you haven't noticed all of the comments in the chat, uh, take some time to look through those because people are sharing some really great information and advice that has helped them. Uh, so that's what's so what's so great about events like this is we can share our knowledge with each other and be part of our amazing community of people who love to travel by bike. So um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for joining this event. We've consistently had over 130 people be part of it, which is really amazing. Um, these types of events are new for adventure cycling. We haven't been doing them long, so we're learning as we go and we appreciate your participation. Um, so now we can answer some more questions. So please put them in the chat. Um, we can go back and look at some of the questions from before too, if, you, if we didn't get to all of those. 
Uh, before I do that, I just want to remind everybody that we have the complimentary six month membership offer and I'll post the link to that again. And I also want to rem remind everybody about our ambassador program. So if you're interested in putting on an event like this, uh, please check out adventurecycling.org forward slash ambassador or send me an email at eva at adventurecycling.org. Um, it looks like, um, do we have any more questions? Allison and Joe, did you see any questions that you really want to answer? Okay, uh, I'm gonna, tracking. we don't have any new questions, so I'm gonna go back and look at some more of our old questions and see if there's any that we really should cover. And like I said, we, oh look, okay, thank you, Paul. It looks like he has a question about charging electronics. I remember seeing that one before. That's a great question. Um, Allison, do you wanna take that one? Um, yes, I bring one of those little Lucy lanterns. Sometimes I bring two of them and those do charge my phone if I have them like on my bike um, or on my pack um, every night. And they also double as a lantern for reading, which is really great. Um, but I know people who bring more complex um, solar setups and bring backup batteries. Joe? Uh, yeah, I, I bring a battery bank, at least one. And then I do use the Lucy as well. The battery bank I have can charge my phone for like a week. So as long as it's charged before I go and then I'll, you know, if I stop somewhere, coffee shop or whatever, um, I'll try and charge that rather than my phone so that I can have that as much as powered as possible. But yeah, battery banks, um, I think Anchor makes a really nice one. They make pretty small and also pretty inexpensive, but will last you probably 10 phone charges. Mm -hmm. So um, And Jolie, I don't, I might be saying your name wrong. Um, yeah, you can get a Lucy that has like a USB portal to charge things. Um, and then I usually turn my navigation or turn my phone on airplane mode because you can still use Google, you know, maps even without. Totally. Mm -hmm. Save some charge. Uh, related to phones and electronics, we had a question earlier about satellite phones when you're out of cell service. Um, do you have any experience with that, Joe or Allison? Um, I have only used them on adventure cycling tours because when we go as a group, we have one at least, and then some people choose to bring their own. So I've gotten to see some people bring satellite phones, some people bring spots. Um, so I've used them, um, you know, different models have subscriptions where you just pay by month, et cetera. It's nice because you can, you know, follow people, let people know you're okay. Most of them now let you send messages, which is really, really, really cool. But I haven't used one personally. I have not either. I, I, mean, I know spot a lot of like guide buddies that are mountain bike or, or mountaineers and things they really heavily rely on spot. So I'd say spot is a really good way to go. It's a very cheap monthly subscription. You can now do two way with spot, which is pretty sweet too. So that'd probably be the best bet in my opinion. Cool. We have another question about tubeless tires. Uh, Joe, do you want to answer this one? Uh, the question is, uh, do you recommend them? And if so, do you like any particular brands or models? Ooh, loaded question. Um, I definitely recommend it. I think tubeless is just like revolutionized so much with biking, um, especially off-road mountain biking. You can run your pressure this, and this is going to be a little bit mountain bike bias for a second. You can run your pressure so much lower. So you're able to dig into corners harder. You're able to worry less about pinch flats, which are, is a pretty big deal in mountain biking. Um, but that said, I still like my gravel bike that I do a ton of touring on. I it's tubeless as well. Um, and it's just, it's, I guess one less thing you need to worry about. Um, because they, I've never had a blowout on my tubeless. I've never had a, I mean, a slash big enough to really need to do anything than what I showed you guys I carry. Um, and it's just the ride quality is a little bit nicer too. It's a little less stiff feeling, I guess you could say. Um, as far as brands go, that is like, going to be a lot of preference on the tread pattern you like the rubber compound i mean a lot of these different rubbers you know you can get your schwalbe marathon tubeless nowadays and so that's still a really thick 
thick rubber that's going to be a stiffer. But I really like WTB um, and Maxxis are really nice for like bike packing for mountain bikes tires type of tires and my gravel bike has a 45 wtb on there as well so a lot of it's just going to come down to your tread preference you know are you looking for efficiency or are you looking for traction there's or are you looking for both there's i mean it's, it's a loaded question it's a i mean you can read some forums i would say go to your local bike shop because they're going to know what type of trails you're going to ride and they'll be able to kind of give you their best bet on what they what they like so but yeah, I mean, touring, even touring road, I, I'm oftentimes on tubeless tires too. Cool. Um, kind of a similar question, what, but what about saddles? Can you recommend any, either Allison or Joe? Totally. Uh, I'm like all about the Brooks C17 saddle. It is uh, not leather. It's like the weird kind of rubberish material. But I bought mine before I did San Francisco to San Diego last fall, a week before I put it on my bike. And I was like, well, I'll have my other saddle shipped out if I need to. But I did two and a half weeks on that with no issues at all. It just, and it's waterproof, so I can ride it on my mountain bike and I can also ride it. Yeah, I just think it's one of the best saddles for both mountain biking, commuting and road touring. Um, I have a Brooks saddle and I use it on my road and on my um, mountain biking. It's leather and I, you know, I'm not the best about treating it and doing all the maintenance, but it, it does, it does hold up and I bought it used. So it was already a little broken in, although not for me, but um, yeah, I approve. Great. We have a, a different type of question about um, the best method to acquire acquiring water in the backcountry, and then um, also kind of related, but filling water bottles in the backcountry, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you go, Allison. No, you, okay. Well, um, I was going to say, Joe talked a little bit about navigation, and that's definitely something you want to think about, not when you're out on your ride, but before you go. So I do bring um, a little squeeze filter that I had somewhere. And um, now I'm just like a sea of bike stuff, which is really fun. Um, but I, I definitely look at maps. I look at where streams are and um, you don't want to take for granted that a stream is going to be there. You might even call someone who's in the area um, and see, you know, like, is it really dry there? Because I've definitely thought, oh, a stream's coming up, I can get water and I'll sit there and I'll filter and fill my camelback and my bottles and my backup reservoir if I'm in a really dry area. If I'm somewhere that's like a lot of water, I might not, I'll just sort of fill as I go. But you kind of want to know um, where your water sources are. I've definitely, you know, thought there was going to be a stream on a map and I got there and it was like this awesome dry, um, path of rocks and that was it. Um, so you kind of want to think about like what the weather has been, call it ahead. Um, what were you going to say, Joe? I was exactly that. I mean, I've looked at maps that have nice streams on them and then they don't really exist. Um, and it's, you know, especially out here in the West, it's very different because so much of our water is very seasonal. So I'm, we're pretty careful about when there's going to be water and not water. And then if it's like, I'm going to fill up with, you know, I'm going to fill up right before I know it's the very last like river. Cause I know the river's not going anywhere. Um, and then from there, I'm going to really try to plan short distances in between where I can either bail or where I can, you know, I know for sure there's going to be water because it's, yeah, it's crucial. And in, in the West, we just don't, it's, it's all seasonal. And so it's, it's rivers are a very nice thing to see. Um, we have a couple questions that are related to the best time of year to bike tour and or just um, also just bike touring in different times of years. So the first one I'm going to ask Joe because um, I'm betting that maybe you've ridden the Idaho hot springs route, have you? I haven't. I've ridden kind of sections around the northern part. Of it, <laughs> okay. Allison, have you ridden that route? I want to so badly. I have it. Okay. So maybe neither of you can answer this, and it probably depends on the year too, but somebody is wondering uh, the earliest they can ride that route. If it's above 5,000 feet, like June, probably, um, anything five to 6,000 feet, you're going to, I mean, you can ride it earlier if you want, but you're going to hit a lot of snow. Um, 
I don't exactly, I think that's kind of in the sawtooth. So I think you're going to get a lot of, a lot of higher elevation and you're just not going to be, it's not going to be passable. There's some routes even just outside of Missoula. I can't ride mountain bike trails. I can't ride until the end of June. And they sit at about 65 to 7,500 feet. So. Great. Um, we had another question about um, winter bike packing. Allison and Joe, do you have some advice to share about winter bike packing? I've done a lot of winter camping. I'm from Minnesota where it's like very cold and I've done a lot of camping there in the winter and camping and bike packing in the winter are different things. Like, you know, you really got to be conscious about how much you're sweating. Um, you're, you, it's nice cause you can carry a lot more than your backpack can a lot of times. Um, but you really just got to be pretty prepared with your, your sweat management and the, way you're giving off moisture because it can really like damage the clothes you're wearing to, you know, the hypothermia is real. And so it's, it's a, definitely a, a tricky thing. Um, and folks that are like really into winter bike packing, like these people that run the Iditarod or, you know, these other races up in Canada, um, they're very serious about it and they take it very seriously. So I'd reach out maybe to some people like that. Um, there's different camps you can do. I think there's one in Wisconsin and then there's one out in Idaho um, that some of these people put on that help you. You can come out for a week and they'll, they'll show you how to bike pack in the snow for a week, basically. But it's definitely not something to take lightly because it's, it's definitely, there's, you're in the back country, but you're in the back country and, you know, potentially below, temp, below zero temperatures. So I don't want to give anybody advice on that, that I can't give you. <clears throat> um. Allison, I will ask you this one. Uh, there is a question about sleeping bags versus blankets. And also it just says, and extra clothes. So I don't, I don't know if you have, maybe you could share some advice about just staying warm when you're sleeping. Yeah, I think um, some people use the blankets or the liners with extra clothes to sort of save weight because you might need those extra clothes and have them with you already. So you then if you plan that as your sleeping method, you're carrying a little less. I, I sleep cold. Um, I, um, you know, if it's summer in Maryland, I will just bring my sleeping bag liner and my pad or my sleeping bag liner and maybe my hammock. Um, but it's, it's again, something that um, I want to look at the weather before I go and then sort of like adjust because sometimes the weather, you know, especially if you're, you know, going for several weeks, um, which might not be right now. Um, you always want to be prepared in case it does get suddenly colder, um, especially if you're at altitude and places like that. Um, but yeah, I think there, there's different um, thoughts about, you know, do I use a quilt? Do I use a sleeping bag? I think maybe Joyce um, and Sid covered a little bit of that in theirs. I use a sleeping bag unless it's summer in Maryland, then I would never need a sleeping bag or want one. And then it's, it's liner time. So that's my thought, Joe. Yeah, I'm a sleeping bag person myself. Um, I same sort of thing. I don't. Um, it gets cold here at night, no matter what. So it's just nice to have. Um, and then if I don't need it, I just don't really use it. But I always carry a pad too because I like to be comfortable when I sleep too. So yeah, yeah. I, I and I have friends that use blankets or like the quilts and everything too. But it's just it's personal preference. I think the sleeping bag is just gonna be everything I need it to be, basically. Joe, how do you adjust PSI with a loaded bike? You don't really. It's going to be kind of hard. I mean, I would just unload your bike, honestly. You can, if you have a really nice hand pump with a, with a gauge on there, that's a very, it puts in very minute amounts of air at a time. You could probably do it, but it's just, you could flip it over too. I guess that'd be a way to do it too, but those things get heavy. I mean, I would just... If you have paneers on, those are easy enough to take off. So just take them off, honestly. There's no tr no real pro tip on that one. Um, we have a question. Maybe, I, I think I want both of you to answer this one. So Allison, maybe you can start. But what's the toughest thing you've had to deal with when bicycle touring or dirt touring? Um, besides like the mental struggles sometimes, um, and getting in your own head, which happens for me. 
Um, I think weather is really big. I, I remember sort of like counting on, um, there's part of the Great Divide where you're coming into Silverton. Is that how you say it? I always forget the names of these towns. And then it turns to pavement and you're going down a mountain pass, you just climb. And I was just like looking forward to that. So this might be a mental psych thing as well. But the headwind was such that on pavement going down a mountain, I still had to pedal. And that was like super demoralizing, you know, when you're expecting to get in at whatever time and it takes you three hours longer and you know, you've got hail or whatever thing like that. But yeah, weather, weather can be, um, the great first stories afterwards can be like a real challenging thing in the moment for me. Yeah, totally. I think weather too. I spent six days in the Superior National Forest up in Northern Minnesota and the first five of them, it poured on us the entire time. So like after day two, there was nothing dry. Our tent wasn't dry. Our sleeping bag wasn't dry. Nothing was dry. And we finally rolled into uh, Grand Marais, which is a town up there. And it, the sun came where we were going to have a hotel and the sun came out and it was sunny for that one day while we were staying in a hotel. And it was just like, this is, you know, it's, it just, you wanted to be done because you're finally dry, but then we left and we were wet then the rest of the tour too. So I like rain, but I don't like rain for six days in a row when I don't have anywhere to stay out of the rain. So uh, weather, and yeah, I would say weather, it always comes down to weather. Awesome. Well, um, we've had a lot of great questions. We're going to take one more because this one has come up a lot. And actually, I know Joe has at least talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to ask it again because I think it's a really important one. But um, how much weight is typical to balance camping comfort versus biking comfort? So Joe, do you want to start? And then Allison, maybe you can also provide some input. Camping comfort versus biking comfort. I don't know. I mean, I couldn't give you an exact number. I think I, I try and balance them out. I think I probably go with comfort more. Um, because yeah, I carry a pad pretty much no matter what. Um, I don't carry a tent. And so that is able to get me more comfort, I guess you could say. I carry clothes that I know I'm going to need unless it's like a two day trip or something like that. But, um, I try and minimize my bike weight as far as the things my bike's going to need to bring more along the side of comfortable and, and camping. Yeah. That's a tough question. Yeah. How about you, Allison? I'm going to listen to you then maybe answer again. Um, that is a tough question. And I feel like I can answer for myself, but it's hard to give advice on because it is really personal. Um, and I think the very best thing to do is try it out, you know, ride with your stuff and see how it feels. Um, and use that stuff to go camping and see how you know, comfortable or miserable you are. And I think, you know, my, my setup is constantly adjusting every ride I go on. I'm carrying something in a slightly different place. I'm bringing something different. And that depends a little bit on like what rides I'm going on. I might need different stuff, but it also depends on, I'm sort of thinking, you know, I, I go on a ride and I see people with their folding chairs. Maybe I need to bring a folding chair. And then I bring a folding chair and I'm like, this isn't worth carrying this folding chair. And so then I leave it, um, behind. I think I, I do err a little more on like, I don't mind going slower um, or like carrying more weight if it means I'm going to like be comfortable. Um, but, you know, sometimes then I'll, I'll have like a day where I just really want to fly and then I'll find the next post office and mail things back to myself. So, you know, <laughs> try it out. I don't have even a method for myself, but um, when we have uh, summer bicycle travelers coming through our office, which, you know, we're not getting a lot this year, but uh, we always have people mailing things home after they're a couple weeks into their trip. So yeah, we've heard that one a lot. <laughs> and probably buying new things in the adventure cycling store, too, right? <laughs> Possibly, yeah, at least maps, that's for sure. They realize that the maps are very helpful. Totally. Well, um, I think we're going to wrap it up, but this has been really fun and I'm so happy we had such a great turnout. And like I said, we're, we've recorded this, we're recording it right now. So we're going to share this with everybody uh, who joined us and everybody who was interested but couldn't join us. And we'll be following up with you in, um, within the next couple of weeks with that recording and some information on our blog about the topic that 
uh, Joe Riemann Snyder and Allison Seeger have been covering dirt touring. Uh, Joe and Allison are both tour leaders and ambassadors with Adventure Cycling Association, and they've graciously volunteered their time to be with us this evening and share this information with us. So thank you to them especially, and thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us. Um, and just one last pitch, please sign up for Bike Travel Weekend and Bike Your Park Day. Go to biketravelweekend.org, and everybody who signs up to participate in any way they want to, either by riding or being involved in a virtual event, which we, we have those, we have the virtual options this year. Uh, it's very easy to participate this year, but you will all be entered to win a salsa cutthroat bike if you register at biketravelweekend.org. So um, again, thank you so much. Special thanks to Allison and Joe and uh, take care everybody. Have a great night. We'll be in touch. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>